Thank you all. I was glad when they said to me, let us go to the house of the Lord. It's good to be here, isn't it? Well, if you would, please turn with me to the end of the book of Exodus. <clears throat> Exodus chapter 40. And Lord willing, I'd like to consider with you this theme or subject of waiting on God. Uh, before we get to our specific text today, I'd like to review briefly uh, the, the context of Exodus 40, which is the tabernacle, or literally the dwelling place of God in the Old Covenant. If you'll remember, the Lord had instructed Moses to construct a tabernacle or a tent of meeting. And just to kind of put our mind's eye right, we'll remember that there was a courtyard, and passing through that veil into the courtyard then, uh, you, you, would have, you would have been met by a bronze altar. And on that altar, uh, burnt offerings would have been given. And then past that, there was a large bath or or lever of bronze for ceremonial washing for the priests. And then past that, you would then come to the tabernacle itself. Of course, you wouldn't have been able to enter there. <laughs> Only the priests would have been there in, in, in those areas. But then passing through that veil, you would have one would have seen, the priest would have seen, the a holy place, and in that holy place there were three main things. There was a, a lampstand and a table for, for showbread, and there was uh, then at the rear of the holy place a golden altar for uh, incense, for incense to be offered there. And, and past then, that altar at the rear of that holy place was yet another veil. And through that veil, once a year, on the Day of Atonement, the high priest would enter into this inner room called the Holy of Holies. And in that Holy of Holies... There was the Ark of the Covenant, or the Ark of the Testimony, there, uh, which was, would have been quite a thing to see, covered in gold there, with cherubim and their wings upward there, and on the top was what was referred to as a mercy seat. And in that Ark of the Covenant, or testimony, was the testimony of God, among other things, or the law as it had been revealed by God to Moses. So Moses is commanded by God to assemble all these things, and he does that. And then Moses anoints or consecrates all of these items. These things are holy that is, they are set apart to the Lord. And Aaron and his sons were told, wash and they put on holy garments and they are anointed. They are set apart as holy to the Lord. And then Moses and Aaron and his sons, they all of them wash their hands and feet. They're in that lever, in that uh, outer courtyard outside the tent of meeting, and there they are standing there in that court outside of the tent of meeting. And we then come to the end of verse 33. If you'll see there, it says, thus Moses finished the work. And then read with me, starting in verse 34 to the end. Thus Moses finished the work. Then the cloud covered the tent of meeting. 
and the glory of the Lord filled the tabernacle. Moses was not able to enter the tent of meeting because the cloud had settled on it. And the glory of the Lord filled the tabernacle. Throughout all their journeys, whenever the cloud was taken up, from over the tabernacle, the sons of Israel would set out. But if the cloud was not taken up, then they did not set out until the day when it was taken up. For throughout all their journeys, the cloud of the Lord was on the tabernacle by day, and there was fire in it by night, in the sight of all the house of Israel. Well, as I mentioned, I'd like to spend some time with you considering this passage and what it means to us today regarding this thing of waiting on God, this thing of depending on God, the necessity of staying with God in our time here on earth, in this pilgrimage. This dependence we have on God is a theme throughout Scripture. It's fundamental to Christianity and the fact that God is the one who is leading us, that God is the one who goes before us. And here are just some examples here emphasizing this thing of waiting on God. I'll just mention a few from the Psalms, although there are many passages. Psalm 27, 14. Wait for the Lord. Be strong and let your heart take courage. Yes, wait for the Lord. Psalm 33, 20. Our soul waits for the Lord. He is our help and our shield. Psalm 33, 7. Rest in the Lord and wait patiently for Him. Psalm 40, 1 and 2. I waited patiently for the Lord. And he inclined to me and heard my cry. He brought me up out of the pit of destruction, out of the miry clay, and he set my feet upon a rock, making my footsteps firm. And then Psalm 62 1 My soul waits in silence for God only. From him is my salvation. He only is my rock and my salvation, my stronghold, I shall not be greatly shaken. So there you have, just there in a few verses, this repeated emphasis and exhortation to this thing of waiting on God. It is a thoroughly biblical idea, but it is one that is not popular in our world today, to say the least, is it? You see, to wait on God presupposes a dependence on God, that you need God, that God is the one who must lead us and guide us, that we have a duty, an obligation, that is, there's an oughtness implicit in our position as men and women and boys and girls created in the image of God to serve God and to worship Him. It's not the other way around. We must submit to God. But these aren't popular things today. What we have in Scripture is an assault to the idea of our so-called individual right right in this world, to do as we wish, to go as we would, to direct the course of our own lives, to do what seems right in our own eyes. The theme of our world today is not the emphasis on what pleases God, but what pleases us. What do I want for myself? Not what God wants for me, right? And uh, this is an issue because now more than ever, it's so easy, it's so convenient for us to get, by and large, what we want. (laughs) 
we go online, we see things we didn't know that we needed, and there we order it. And it doesn't take long to come, which is good because I don't expect it to take long. In just a few days, or I mean, if you live in a big city, you can use a process online where in a few hours even, something can be delivered right to your door. And this is amazing. This is wonderful. If I have the means financially, I can buy it, and I can have near instant gratification. So we live in this marvelous age of convenience. But I would say that with that convenience, we have all but lost the very idea of having to wait for anything, let alone to wait for anyone. There is usually no need for us to wait in line, right? Because virtually... Speaking, we can always be the first in line. That's the world we live in now. Man is at the center in a secular world philosophy. Man is at the top. He is the one in charge. He is the one who is constructing the reality of his own existence, right? What is the common mantra? Have it your way. Just have it your way. Whatever you want, it can be made to order. But this is not the Christian perspective. Man is the creature. He is not the creator. And because of this, he is, whether he recognizes it or not, he is fundamentally dependent on God. And as I hope we'll see together this morning, Scripture gives us a clear call to wait on Him, to look to Him, to depend on Him alone to lead us and to guide us in life in the way we should go. Waiting on God is not what fallen, sinful men do. Because... The fallen man of himself, in his own mind, doesn't think that he needs God. We're told in Psalm 10.4 that God is in none of his thoughts. He doesn't think of God. He doesn't care for God. It's something, it's something irrelevant in the minds of some, but certainly optional in the minds of many other people. But this isn't something that's unique to us today. Even if you take away all of the stumbling blocks that are unique to our age today in the form of convenience, which promote this self-centered view of our existence, even with these things stripped away, we're forced to recognize that the age-old tale of humanity has been the same. That the very history of mankind is a record of the fact that natural man left to himself will do anything but wait on God because he doesn't think he depends on God in any way. He doesn't fear God. He is blind of himself to the glory of God, largely due to the fact of his pride. It is arrogant not to see your need of God. There's an impulsiveness, there's a prayerlessness that comes in this idea of constructing your life apart from God. The lost man doesn't ask God because he doesn't think he needs God. There can be the occasional self-seeking interest in God. This is crisis Christianity, right? I have no need of God, but I'm in a terrible strait now. Things have happened to me in my design for my life that I didn't anticipate, and now I need God to come in and help me get back to where I was, which is on this glorious path of seeking my own ends. It has nothing to do with the glory of God. It is self-seeking. This happens periodically in the lost person's life, but it's not Christianity. It is crisis 
Christendom, right? It was pride and it was arrogance that resulted in the very fall of mankind. You remember they're back in the Garden of Eden. Adam and Eve are called to wait on God to determine for them what is right and what is wrong, what is good and what is evil. God doesn't ask man's opinion, well, what do you think we should do? He doesn't do that, does it? He doesn't ask man's advice. He simply declares this, from any tree of the garden you may eat freely, but from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil you shall not eat, for in the day that you eat from it you will surely die. Well, what is man's response? Ultimately, it's this. I'm not going to wait on God. I'm not going to trust God. I'm not going to place my all on God. I'm not going to trust in the goodness and the faithfulness of God. Psalm 84.11 says, No good thing does he withhold from those who walk uprightly. We know that God is a God who delights to give good gifts to his children. James says every good and perfect gift comes down from above, from the Father of lights, with whom there is no variation, no shifting of shadow. But the lost man says, no, 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 I'm not going to believe in that. I'm not going to believe in God's word. I'm going to believe the devil. I'm going to believe the slanderer instead of believing God. So Adam and Eve, they don't wait on God to give them what is good. Instead, they go against the word of God, as we know, and they take for themselves what they want. Instead of allowing God to determine for them what is good and what is evil, they say, no, no, I'm going to determine for myself what is right and what is wrong. And they eat of the tree, and as we're told in Romans 5, 12, then sin enters into the world, and death through sin. And so death spreads to all men, because all sinned. There is no one subsequently who has been left unaffected by this original fall. We are all born into this world sinners, dead in our sin, unable of ourselves to be right with God. No one has escaped that. In the fall of man and the refusal to wait on God of ourselves, we're slaves to sin. We're slaves to this inward collapse this fixation on self, this refusal to depend and wait on God. Well, we can be thankful that there is another grand theme in the Word of God, can't we? That from Genesis to Revelation, the central theme of redemptive history is that Jesus Christ is the one mediator between God and man that Jesus Christ is the perfect Lamb of God, that Jesus Christ, fully God and fully man, fulfilled the law on behalf of his church, that he paid for her sins with his own blood, that he took the wrath of God upon himself, that we might be justified by faith and be made right with him. The grand analogy of the redemption of God for his people is seen in the Old Testament in the nation of Israel, how God miraculously delivers Israel from slavery in Egypt by providing one way of salvation, one way to be released from slavery in Egypt Passing through the Red Sea, you remember how they miraculously were delivered from Pharaoh, how they walked across there the way through the Red Sea on dry ground. They were slaves in Egypt, but now now they're free. But in this freedom, we see that God's people 
are nevertheless completely dependent on him. That does not change. Being justified, being declared righteous by faith in Jesus Christ, does not mean that we go out and do what we want. That is a mockery of the gospel. This idea that Jesus Christ can be your Savior, but not be your Lord. That is a fictitious construction. It does not exist. It is false. It is a lie. If Jesus Christ is a Savior, he is a Lord. In salvation, the Christian is still a slave. The grand difference is that the Christian is now under a new master. And Romans 6 goes into that in detail, that through Jesus Christ, the soul is transferred from slavery to sin to being enslaved to the things of God. Brethren, we need to be reminded daily that God does not save us so that we can live our own lives. We need to be reminded that the Christian is at all times, regardless of how we feel, cast upon God. The Christian is dependent on God all of his days because God himself is his life. A servant is not greater than his master, and we find that Jesus Christ was completely dependent on his Father all the days of his earthly ministry. What do we find right after Jesus Christ is baptized in the Holy Spirit at the beginning of his earthly ministry? We see that the Spirit of God leads him in the wilderness to be tempted for 40 days there with this fasting. And how does Christ answer Satan? Remember that? Our Lord says, it is written, man shall not live on bread alone, but on every word that proceeds out of the mouth of God. You see that? Man lives by the word of God. Jesus Christ is completely dependent on his Father, and so it is the same with us. So this nation of Israel is freed from Egypt, and and what happens? They're led into the wilderness to be tested, to be tried, to be sanctified. God is the one who must provide for them water and food. God is the one who goes before them to lead them with this cloud visible by day and fire by night. They're free from Egypt, but they remain helplessly cast on God, daily looking to Him, daily dependent on the real presence of God. And we see the same dependence in the verses we read there in Exodus 40, 34 through 38. I want to just make a few observations here this morning. The first is that God has a plan for his people. God did not lead Israel out of Egypt for nothing. He brought them out of Egypt in order to bring them into the promised land. God has a plan for his people, and if you are a Christian, God has a plan for you to bring you out of sin to bring you out of the system of this world, to bring you even out of yourself and your own ideas, what you think you need for yourself, what you think will make you happy, to bring you out of all these things and into his own presence. God has a plan. We can trust God. 
That is the first thing. God has a plan for his people. The second is this. The safest place for you to be is where God is. Well, you say, well, God is omnipresent. Yes, that's true. God is everywhere. He fills time and space. You go to the highest heavens, he is there. You go to the lowest depths, he is there. Where can I go from your presence? That is true. You can't get any further away from God than you are now, and you can't get any closer to God than you are right now, in a sense. But spiritually speaking, we also see that it is also true that God manifests himself in special ways, in real ways, as we wait on him. David says in Psalm 43, 28, the nearness of God is my good. The nearness of God. Well, look here again with me at Exodus 40, verse 34 to 35. It says, Then the cloud covered the tent of meeting, and the glory of the Lord filled the tabernacle. Moses was not able to enter the tent of meeting because the cloud had settled on it. And again, it says, The glory of the Lord filled the tabernacle. Yes, God is everywhere. But brethren, God fills things. And when God is exalted, man is diminished. Man is brought low. When God manifests his glory, man gets out of the way. Moses, we're told, couldn't even go into the tabernacle. He wasn't able to enter. He couldn't handle the fact of the real presence of God. There wasn't room for Moses, you see, because God was there in his glory. When God meets with men, God is exalted and man is brought low. In Matthew 28, we see that when the disciples saw Jesus, they worshipped him. And literally there, that worshipped him means to be brought low, to bow down, to kiss the ground. They see the glory of God himself, Jesus Christ, the Son of Man, and they worship him by bowing down before him. And if you're a Christian, you know that you cannot survive this journey without the reality of the presence of God. You have to feed upon this reality in order to get through this journey. You have to be where God is. That's why you're here this morning. I want to be in the presence of God with the people of God. There's a hunger for the knowledge of the glory of God. This is why the Puritans and Whitfield and Spurgeon and Lloyd-Jones and A.W. Tozer and others like them are so notable. It's so obvious that in the lives of these men, there was the real presence of God. They had been in the presence of God. But yet, it seems risky. It shouldn't. But with fleshly eyes, it seems risky for us to let go of the circumstances of our lives, for us to get out of the way, to stand aside, and to wait on God. After all, if you give up, you depend on God. I mean, you really depend on God. Who knows what will happen, right? Well, I'll tell you what will happen. This isn't a secret. You don't need to turn there, but it's recorded in Exodus 33. Moses says to God, I pray you, show me your glory. 
And the Lord says to Moses, I myself will make all my goodness pass before you. And I will be gracious to whom I will be gracious, and I will show compassion on whom I will show compassion. You get out of the way and allow the glory of God, as it were, as though the glory of God can be stopped or contained, but as it were, you get out of the way, the glory of God comes in. There's going to be goodness and grace and compassion in the presence of God. That's what's going to happen. There's no secret there. But in order to be ready for his presence, we need to stand down. We have to stand down. He, Moses was off to the side, if you remember. He was in the cleft of the rock when the glory of God swept by. He was not center stage, was he? Where are we? Are we off to the side? Your life will be the grandest and the best adventure you can imagine if you will let go and get out of God's way. You're not in control now, and I hate to tell you this, but you have never been in control. You have never been in control of your life for one moment. Ever. Embrace the reality of these things. In addition to the fact that God has a plan for his people and that the best possible place for you to be is in his presence, we also have this. The absolute certainty of God's leading Look at verse 36 with me. Throughout all their journeys, whenever the cloud was taken up from over the tabernacle, the sons of Israel would set out. Throughout all their journeys. You see, God doesn't lead his people occasionally, intermittently, sporadically. He leads his people throughout all our journeys. You see this again, emphasized intentionally in verse 36. Look at it there. For throughout all their journeys. You see that? God doesn't change. God never fails. Listen to these amazing words from Deuteronomy 31. 6 and 8, be strong and courageous, do not be afraid or tremble, for the Lord your God is the one who goes with you. He will not fail you or forsake you. The Lord is the one who goes ahead of you. He will be with you. He will not fail you or forsake you. Do not fear or be dismayed. What comfort! What security there is for the Christian who is abiding in the presence of God. Our Lord said, all that the Father gives me will come to me, and the one who comes to me I will certainly not cast out. You come to Jesus Christ by faith in him. There's security there. There's a foundation there. You're on a rock there in Jesus Christ. Waiting on God implies that God is the one who is leading rather than you. It implies that God is the one who is going before us. So let us let go. Let us get out of the way. Let us allow God, again, if you will, as though you can stop him, but let us let God determine for us what is right and what is wrong rather than trying with all our 
little might to determine what is right and wrong for ourselves, let us wait for him and rest on him and embrace the reality of a total dependence on God. Let us be cast on him. To be filled with the presence of God, we have to be empty of ourselves. Thinking of that classic hymn, where it says, Empty that thou shouldst fill me, a clean vessel in thy hand, with no power but as thou givest graciously with each command. Emptied that thou shouldst fill me. Our hands have to be open before the Lord. Nothing held back from God if we're really waiting on Him. That's the posture. Empty hands before the Lord. We have to acknowledge that God is the one who determines and directs the course of our lives rather than trying to direct the course of our lives for ourselves. I was thinking of a great summary of the things we've considered this morning, which is found in an old confession called the Belgic Confession. Now, I don't agree with everything in that confession, which is fine. It's not, in, it's not infallible. But Article 13 of the Belgic Confession says this, Nothing can befall us by chance, but by the direction of our most gracious and heavenly Father, who watches over us with paternal care, keeping all creatures so under his power that not a hair of our head, for they're all numbered, nor a sparrow can fall to the ground without the will of our Father, in whom we do entirely trust, being persuaded that he so restrains the devil and our enemies that without his will and permission, they cannot hurt us. Do we believe in these things? Do we believe in a God who is truly sovereign, that we have been made by him, that we are made for him, that we wake up each day in God's world? Notice one word with me in verse 36, and that is the word whenever. Whenever the cloud was taken up, the nation of Israel would set out. Whenever. They didn't know when. Whenever. To be ready for whenever God moves. Let me encourage you not to let your heart be tied down to the things of the world. We have to be ready to move when God moves. What does this mean? Don't try to bring a piano on a bear hunt, right? We're pilgrims here. We don't have a lasting city here. Don't get too comfortable here. Can we say from our hearts to the Lord, take my house, take my car, take everything, take me, it's yours, do with it as you wish. I have no plans for myself. None. I have no prerogative. I have no objective other than to seek your presence and to be where you are. Because I need you. I can't survive without you. I do not know the way. Nothing less than desperation, nothing less than a hunger for God and for his glory will make you let go. Only a desperation to follow God whenever he moves will keep you from the temptation of being satisfied with what the world has to offer you, which is fool's gold, my friend. 
fool's gold. Numbers 9.16 says, Whenever the cloud was lifted from over the tent, afterward the sons of Israel would set out, and in the place where the cloud settled down, there the sons of Israel would camp. Whenever the cloud was lifted. Numbers 9.22, whether it was two days or a month or a year that the cloud lingered over the tabernacle, staying above it, the sons of Israel remained camped and did not set out. But when it was lifted up, they did set out. In one sense, they dare not stir from their place because the glory of God was there. But as soon as the cloud lifted, we're, we're gone. We're, we must be after God. We must be with God. You see, are you ready for whenever God moves? You can't schedule whenever. You can't see whenever in advance. That is the one word, whenever. Notice with me another word, and that is in verse 37, and that is the word until. Read with me verse 37. But if the cloud was not taken up, then they did not set out until the day when it was taken up. Israel remained camped until the day God moved. See, there has to be a balance between the whenever and the until. In one sense, the Christian should be the most discontented person in the world that exists. Because he looks around him and he is empty here and empty here and empty there. This does not satisfy, and that does not satisfy. I am disappointed again and again and again and again by everything around me. But in another sense, the Christian is to be the most contented person in the world because he has God. He is satisfied with God. Whenever God moves providentially to alter circumstances in our lives, our hearts should hunger to go after God. But we dare not take one step until God takes a step. We also don't want to lag behind God, it's true, otherwise you're not following God. But we don't, we don't want to take a step apart from God. He must be before us, but we don't want to lag too far behind him. We must be after him, following him, going with him. Moses said to the Lord in Exodus 33, If your presence does not go with us, do not lead us up from here. Moses was afraid. He was afraid to go on without God. He says, For how then can it be known that I have found favor in your sight, I and your people? Is it not by your going with us? You see that? What characterizes fundamentally the church? What characterizes fundamentally the Christian? The presence of God. The Christian is one who goes with God. The church is the collective body that is going with God. How can it be known? How can it be known that I am right with God apart from the presence of God? It is impossible. So Moses pleads that God would go with them. That was his burden. And the question before us today then is, what is our burden? 
What is our appetite? What do we want? We can theorize about this and that, but sometimes it comes down to very basic questions. What do you want? What are you after in this life? And do you want God? Or do you have other goals? Do you have other ideas? See, the issue is not whether God can be trusted. You're fooling yourself if that's your concern. The issue is not the faithfulness of God. The issue is your own unbelief. Read with me verse 38 of Exodus 40. For throughout all their journeys, the cloud of the Lord was on the tabernacle by day, and there was fire in it by night, in the sight of all the house of Israel. In the sight of all the house of Israel. The faithfulness of God is in plain view, brethren. Plain sight in the person of Jesus Christ. It cannot be denied. If time permitted us and we went on into Deuteronomy, we'd find the words of Moses. Deuteronomy 1, starting in verse 30 as these, the Lord, your God, who goes before you, will himself fight on your behalf just as he did for you in Egypt before your eyes, and in the wilderness where you saw how the Lord your God carried you, just as a man carries his son, and all the way which you've walked until you came to this place. But for all this... You did not trust the Lord your God, who goes before you on your way to seek out a place for you to encamp in fire by night and cloud by day to show you the way in which you should go. God is so faithful. God is the one who has carried his people. God is the one who goes before us. God is the one who picks out the campsite. He's the one who shows us the way. But for all this, they did not trust the Lord. There's great freedom in letting go. There's great freedom in going with God, in allowing God, as it were, to guide and direct us. Freedom in simply trusting God to show us what is right. Freedom from being a slave to the system of this world, most people spend their lives trying to be like everyone else in this world. Well, the neighbors have the, well, yeah, well, I thought my car was okay, but the neighbors say, you know, I, I, I need to polish this up. There's no, nothing wrong having a car, obviously. I'm thankful for my car. But you see what I mean. The burden becomes what's going on around you. The burden becomes the system of the world. You end up becoming enslaved to men rather than continuing on looking to the Lord. Lord, may the Lord help us to be ready for the whenever, but to be content to wait for the until, knowing that God's timing is perfect, knowing that at an acceptable time, he'll make his way clear to us. We have great comfort today in the word of God, great encouragement to take hold of the hope that is before us, knowing that he who did not spare his own son but delivered him up for us, how will he not also with him Freely give us all things. 
God's not going to hold anything back from you. There was a, a theologian, a Puritan, who lived in the 16th and 17th centuries named Richard Sibbs. And he wrote this regarding Jesus Christ. That Jesus Christ became not only a man but a curse. A man of sorrows for us. He was broken that we should not be broken. He was troubled that we should not be desperately troubled. He became a curse that we should not be accursed. Whatever may be wished for in an all-sufficient comforter is all to be found in Christ. May the Lord give us faith to trust in Him regardless of circumstances in our lives. Israel didn't choose the campsites. Sometimes it was pleasant. Sometimes it was hard. If you remember there earlier in Exodus that before God brought them to a paradise called Ilam, which had 12 springs and 70 uh, date palms, before he brought them to that place, he brought Israel to the bitter waters of Marah in Exodus 15. See, there can be drastic changes in our earthly outward position, in our, ex- in our environment, in, in earthly circumstances. But we have to believe that the bitter waters are just as right for us as the paradise if we remain in the presence of God. So let me urge you, in closing, to remain with God in the condition in which he has called you. Remain with God. That is a a glorious phrase found in 1 Corinthians 7, which admittedly is a complex passage regarding all sorts of things, marriage and the way that a father treats his daughter, whether or not a, 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 a... newly converted individuals should change in their relationship with their unbelieving spouse. It's a complicated chapter. But nevertheless, there's this glorious truth woven throughout that chapter with an emphasis on the repeated word remain, translated abide. And the, <clears throat> the summary, the overarching idea there is that We must trust the providence of God. We must rest upon God. We must wait upon God. We must not try to change, to attempt to change a divine providence. We can't compare our lives with what God is doing in someone else's life. God's work is unique in each of our lives. Yes, We are all in Jesus Christ being conformed to his image. But regeneration doesn't mean that you lose your conscious experience of your own individuality. You're not lost and absorbed into the nothingness, into the unknown. That's that's pantheism. That's not Christianity. God has purposed to make you a new creation. You. Which means he has an individualized sanctification plan, pre-written, custom-made, just for you. And what you need in this life might not be the same thing that someone else needs. Because you're not that person. God is not going to obliterate you. He is going to save you, you see. He has exercises for you in his gymnasium for your spiritual growth. Yes, you will feel the lactic acid burn 
from time to time. You will feel it. But God is not harming you. He is growing you into the person of Jesus Christ. So remain with God. Look to him. Seek his glory. Seek his presence above all else, trusting that it is there alone that we find his goodness and his grace and his compassion. Let's pray. O oh Lord, we confess that we are inadequate for these things, Lord. We pray that you would help us to wait upon you more each day. We pray that we would be empty of ourselves, empty of the world, and full of you. We pray that you would draw us nearer to your presence, through the perfect work of Jesus Christ, our great high priest, that we might be satisfied, Lord, forever in you. Lord, we pray that you would show us your glory for your name's sake, that you would keep us for yourselves without stain and without blemish, Lord, until the day when we see you face to face and know you fully on that day even now as we are today fully known by you. Help us, Lord, to be ready for whenever you move in our lives, but to be content to wait until you move. In the perfect name of our all-sufficient Savior, we pray. Amen. Wondering if we might, before we close, sing number 77 in the white book.